Greg Refner with the Abstract Podcast. And we have Ashley Early, head of sales at the Duckbill Group and host and CEO of the other side of sales. Ashley, please say hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be fun. Yeah. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, you're uh, the first podcast host that we've had on our podcast. So uh, I'm excited to, to have you on board. And, um, you know, we're, we have kind of a, I like to call it a, I think it's a six letter dirty word script we're going to be talking about today and how scripts are used. But um, before we dive into that topic, you know, I'd love it if you gave our audience a little bit of backgrounds on kind of where you got, how you got to your career, um, maybe why you started a podcast, like who's Ashley? Yeah, um, actually, I can start with scripts. Um, I <laughs> go figure. Um, I came up in musical theater and music. So wow, I okay. spent my childhood literally from age, oh God, I don't even know, five, I think I was in my first show learning scripts and learning music and then learning how to take that and make it my own and perform and literally my whole life um all the way up through college where i ended up studying opera and i literally have a degree in opera um so i have this background of performing arts which is not a lucrative career and I'm very, I, I have always been very realistic about that in the sense of like, I always do it for fun. It's a passion project. I adore it, but I never wanted to make it a career. So college was really fun because I'm in a, I'm in a music program. Everyone else is stressing out about grad school and I'm just enjoying the ride. I'm like, I've got four years to get as good at this as I can and have as much fun. And then I probably won't do anything with it. And that's okay. I, don't, I didn't need to. Um, my dad gave me the brilliant advice when I went to college. He's like, look, no one cares what you studied in college. They just care that you have a degree. So study whatever makes you happy. So yeah. I, which is fabulous advice and absolutely true. Yeah. So I graduated with uh, two degrees, a degree in music and a degree in political science. Okay. So um, I have a BS in BS and a BA <laughs> in archaic music that nobody listens to anymore. <laughs> And then I graduated from college at the height of the recession, the Great Recession, um, 2009, and I had no clue what to do with my life. And so I fell into a couple different jobs and after and trying to survive in Silicon Valley, where the rents increase 400 bucks every year, and you keep moving to shittier and shittier apartments to try and keep up with the fact that rent's going up and hit rock by at the bottom when we moved into an apartment. And literally the day we moved in, they made us sign an asbestos waiver. Oh, sweet. I was like, that's awesome. This is not working. This is not, yeah. I can't keep working 70, 80 hours a week, three jobs. I never see my husband. I'm newly married. This ain't working. And after finally, after another panicked call to my parents going, what do I do? My dad who has been in sales his whole life was like, okay, Ashley, it's time. You need to go get a sales job. I don't want to, cause you traveled all the time and I don't want to do that. I want to be here. And he's like, yeah, that's not, I was selling telecommunications equipment in the eighties. You will not be traveling like that. Don't worry about it. He set me up to talk with a couple of his colleagues that I knew and they echoed what my dad said. So it got through to me in a way that, you know, when your parents say something, you don't really hear it, but then you hear from somebody else. And it's like, why didn't you tell me that dad? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Dad's like, I did like 30 times. Yeah. And I jumped into sales with a company called Arista Networks. I was their second SDR hire. And it was literally here's Salesforce. We're going to give you one day of product training. I was selling uh, 10 gigabit ethernet switches. Um, right. I didn't know what that was. They gave me a copy of networking for dummies and said, start calling. And I was calling, you know, VPs of infrastructure and heads of IT at fortune 100 companies. And I had no clue what I was doing. I was terrible. Oh God, I was so terrible. Um, but what I found I did have was I had this history with scripting. I knew how to take someone else's words and make them sound like my own and how to adjust and think about it in such a way that it's reactive. Cause one of the things that I really enjoyed doing, I wasn't great at it, but I enjoyed it was improv. Okay. And improv is all about really deep listening 
and following kind of a set structure of a storyline. So a lot of people don't realize if you watch like Who's Line or whatever, they have a structure. There is a rhythm to the jokes that is yep. known in advance. Um, they're not making everything up on the fly. That would be terrible. But figuring out how to take that structure and kind of hang talking points on it, I got had a lot of success very quickly, um, which was really exciting. And then I discovered Silicon Valley is highly unstable. And despite having a lot of success, I ended up being an SDR at three different companies in under a year. Wow. Okay. And then I landed at a, and then I landed at FireEye, which was an incredibly successful company. And I got to be there during their period of hyper growth. I got to go through my first IPO. I got promoted into management largely because of my ability to build scripts and training for other people to come on board. So they literally right. shipped me out to Utah to build, literally I was promoted into management, moved to another state and told hire 15 people <laughs> now. Um, Sounds about right. Yeah. You know, uh, and literally the night before I was supposed to start interviewing people, they booked me for a day of interviews and I called HR and I was like, so what do I ask in the interviews? And HR <laughs> literally said, don't do anything illegal. So I'm like frantically Googling the night before my first day as a manager, what can I ask in an interview and what can't I ask? because I was so scared of like doing something illegal. Like, yeah, I don't even know what that is. Um, yeah. And over time, you know, worked at a bunch of different companies, Pernix Data, Mattermark, did several years at Okta, did another IPO with Okta, which was fantastic. And I hit a point in uh, literally December, I think December 19th, 20, uh, December 19th, 2019, um, I was laid off unexpectedly for the third time in three years. And I hit my breaking point and I was just like, I'm done with corporate America. I'm done with my income and my life being dictated by these other people. I'm doing my own thing. And yeah. that's how kind of I moved into consulting and fractional sales leadership. And my timing was very interesting because I incorporated as a consultant on January, January 17th, uh, 2020. So that was really interesting time where I was trying to build a business in the middle of a pandemic. And then yeah. in the middle of the pandemic, I also decided, you know what? I don't want to live in the U.S. anymore. And so my husband and I moved to the Netherlands. So I also threw an international move in there because I'm apparently a masochist. Um, but one of the things that's really kind of held true is, again, finding this structure that you can hang things on. I've done this with a lot of companies at this point. But one of the things that that enables you to do is something that I figured out very early and it took me years to realize I was one of the few people that knew it, which is if you give someone this struck a good structure and a good fundamental understanding of the business, not the product or the script, the business, anyone can be successful in sales. Because what I yeah. saw when I went into companies was I'd walk into floors where no one looked like me. Literally, um, I, I, I might, there might be a few women, there wouldn't be a ton. Um, and none of them, of the women at least, even, I mean, literally looked like me. You know, they, they, they were amazing, incredible women, but it, we were all kind of fending for ourselves, trying to keep our heads above water. And this led to a conversation in a bathroom with another woman at a sales conference. Um, became a, one of my dearest friends and my original co-founder, Casey Jones, us meeting literally met in the bathroom at a sales conference and started cracking jokes in the mirror about how sales conferences are the only conferences we can go to where there's never a line in the ladies room because there aren't enough women in sales. <laughs> and just laughing about that. And a few months later, just sharing this kind of otherness that we always felt in the sales communities on the sales floors that we've been on. And trying to go find, we both had this, we both had um, experiences where we were trying to find people who sold like us. Because uh, give you a great example, I adore corporate bro. I have the biggest like media crush on him and his work. Oh my God, it's so, it's so good. It's so freaking good. But it's satire. Uh. And, but it's real though, because what makes it so brilliant is I've heard 80% <laughs> of the stuff that he does from sales leaders on the floor. And I can't sell like that. I can't hit my numbers like that. I, I can't be me like that. It, it, that's not going to work. And I had a ton of success not doing that stuff. 
So when it came time to look for, okay, who, where can I find people who are selling like me? That didn't exist. So in 2018, um, Casey and I started the other, or sorry, 2019, uh, Casey and I started the other side of sales. So it's a biweekly podcast um, featuring basically it's, it's, we're devoted to making B2B sales culture truly inclusive. And we do that by having conversations with sales pros from underrepresented groups. So any, if you've ever felt like an other in sales, go to othersideofsales.com. We're approaching a hundred episodes at this point. We're going to redo the search functionality soon, but I guarantee there is someone on there that you should be able to identify with. And if nothing else, you've got a good one hour interview with them, understanding their story, what's made them successful, lessons they've learned along the way. And at a minimum, somebody can go follow on LinkedIn, get some more content, or just reach out and connect to pretty much everyone who comes on the show is like, please reach out, please connect. Because nice. the way to counter otherness is with connection. And that's what right. we're trying to facilitate a little bit more so that everyone can be successful because this is the, the best career in the world that can literally change lives if you can get the proper support and there's no reason to stay in a job where you're not supported. So, yeah. I appreciate that. Well, three comments to that. Um, in, in seventh grade, I played a witch in Macbeth. And oh, double, double toil and trouble. I that love was it. my line. That was actually my line. And from that point forward, I swore I would never get on stage again because that was miserable. Um, so I do not share the same uh, appreciation for theater and improv. One of my Two. highlights was I got to do Lady Macduff in Macbeth, which has like this great death scene. <clears throat> like I got to do a full operatic death scream on stage. It was so much fun. So okay. much fun. I'm glad you enjoyed that. Um, second thing, my dad um, does everything he possibly can to this day to talk me out of a career in sales um, because he thought that it was the worst job ever and I would end up selling used cars for the rest of my life. No, the, the, stigma, think, we, the stigma we face as a career is something we're going to have to reckon with in, in the next 10, 15 years. Like people hear sales and they think, Marmy used car salesman or Glengarry Glen Ross or Wolf of Wall Street. Yep. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I have seen I have seen drugs on the floor. That's not okay. <laughs> I've seen it. It happens, but it's so rare. Like when I saw it, I was like, did did that just happen? Did you That's, just it's the exception, that? not the norm? You can't do like, that. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and third, I uh I don't share this with a lot of people, <clears throat> but I've always kind of felt a little out of place in sales because I'm very much a hardcore introvert. The thought of being surrounded by other people is actually terrifying to me. It drains my, my energy, if you will. And so inside sales, being able to kind of like be by myself in a lot of ways has been so helpful because <clears throat> I'm not forced into that kind of like boiler room environment. And so tech sales has been a natural kind of, I think, a uh, path for me. So I appreciate the fact that your podcast kind of focuses on um, kind of diverse groups of people that don't fit that stereotypical uh, kind of mold that everyone thinks a tech sales rep is supposed to be. So I appreciate oh, it, you focusing on that. And that's so important. I've called this out before. If I think of like the top five best salespeople I have ever run into in my life, three or four of them are hardcore introverts. It, like this idea that you have to, that a lot of sales leaders are starting to wake up to, like this idea that you go out and you hire the loudest person who's the most impressive, it, it, that's not really necessarily the right thing to do. In fact, a lot of cases, that personality is going to really struggle. Like I can get like um, something that made me very successful early on is I am a hardcore nerd. Um, super geek. I have seen every episode of Star Trek um, probably four <laughs> or five times at this point in certain episodes of TNG, I can recite from memory. Um, it's, it's a thing. I am deeply into all things sci-fi, a lot of fantasy, all those things. So I get along very well with engineers and with IT people who are also super nerdy and we can, yeah. I can make jokes and geek out and have fun. Yeah. And that helped me get along with them really quickly, really easily, where some of my colleagues really struggled because they're coming in and they're using all the classic sales plays and it's just turning them off. They feel it as very, it, this persona is very uh, skeptical. And especially because early in my career, I was selling into security. 
they're doubly skeptical. So they're skeptical from a personality standpoint that people who go into that field tend to be a little more introverted, a little more cautious, but then their career itself makes them paranoid. They, they have to be, it's what makes them good at their job. Yeah. So if you start doing any sort of manipulation or overt trying to you know, uh, create situations, they're wise to it. Um, they can smell quota breath like you wouldn't believe. Uh, the only people I think who smell quota breath more than security people are VPs of sales. Yeah. Because v and VPs of sales, they don't smell the quota breath. They have the way they like to be sold to, and they have no problem telling you if you're not doing it the way they want to be sold to, which is like, you have to kind of guess which, all right, so which, are you a sandler? Are you a challenger? Or, okay, which method am I going to use here so that you don't get mad at me for doing it wrong? Um, but yeah, it's it, this, this, and that's the thing is the best salespeople match and can, again, you have a structure that's the same every time, but they're matching their words, they're matching their sequences, they're matching their mannerisms to between where they're strong and where they're going to create connections with their buyer. And so that doesn't matter. I, th I think introverts, <clears throat> and we're going. I promise you, we we're going to go off on a tangent, Ashley. And here we go. I, know. Um, I do a lot of that. <laughs> um, I think introverts, by sheer nature of the fact that they like to listen and observe, um, are naturally better at picking up on how to connect with people and match body language, match tone of voice, and and do that mirroring because they're more focused on kind of taking in the world around them as opposed to kind of being that focus of the world and of that situation. So um, I, I think it goes even deeper than that. They're super comfortable making the client the star. Uh, yeah. 100%. That they, they are super comfortable. It, it's almost second like nature for them where I am an extrovert. I have to actively check myself in a sales process to make sure that I'm not over talking to make sure I'm I'm double, triple, quadruple checking because I can by my instinct is to be effusive and outgoing and put everyone at ease. But that can steamroll if I'm not very careful. And I've learned that the hard way. I have I have absolutely alienated people and then had to go back and do damage control. Yeah. But like I, I think said, you they, you're gonna if you're gonna hire extroverts, you gotta be ready for the bull in the China shop and accept the consequences. In a lot of ways, introverts bring a lot of strengths, especially early on, especially in highly detailed process-based prospecting. Mm -hmm. An extrovert's going to be trying to break that process every chance they get. An introvert, you know, tell them where to go. They got it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you just said they kind of, I, I can remember back when I was selling, it was always uncomfortable for me when people would be like, hey, why, are you, why is your company better than everybody else's? I hated kind of getting that attention and I would do everything I possibly could to flip it around and bring it back to the prospect to make them the center of attention to make, you know, let's dive into why you're even asking that question in the first place. So that's a, I think I'm gonna write a blog post about that. So thank you for that inspiration on that topic, Ashley. Love it. Just make sure to tag uh, other side of sales. I will. <laughs> I'll make sure Claire does our back leaking for us and stuff like that. I'll make sure we tag all that. Um, Back on topic, scripts. So you got your start in, in op, or theater, opera, improv. And I love that you're kind of alluding to this idea of you have a framework, you have a roadmap in place. And you essentially just build guardrails for people. Here's kind of the lanes you can stay in, how you navigate those lanes and how you kind of shift your, you know, your, your processes back and forth. Um, that's up to you, right? I'm gonna let you go be you but here's your guardrails. Here's your, your roadmap on how to get there. I have my own thoughts as to why more companies don't take that approach, but I'd love to hear it from you since this is kind of the world you live in where how come there is so much emphasis on here's your script, follow it, as opposed to here's kind of the, the, the box of Legos, you know, go build it how you want it. Yeah. Um, there's a few factors in place and I work with these days, I'm predominantly focused on smaller startups. So we're talking teams, like entire sales organizations between one and 50 at most. Um, 
But in my career, I've worked with a lot of companies. Um, I'm doing some email work with a client right now that's got a 150 person SDR team. Okay. So PM bit, all depends on the situation. Um, the more name recognition you have, the more people understand about your product coming into the call, the easier it is to get to tighten those guardrails and you want to tighten the guardrails so that the client experience is consistent. That's important, that makes sense. Where I think a lot of companies struggle in their early days, especially with scripting, is a desire to control something that can't be controlled. So I see this with a lot of founders. I see this with a lot of, uh, I'm calling this out more and more and it's gonna get me in trouble one of these days, uh, with a lot of VC backed companies. They bring in someone who writes a script and then they tell everyone to stick to the script. And the, the script is fine, but the script is not going to sound good in everybody's voice. So this is not, you know, with acting and stuff like that, with, with theater, your character is created by the script. So that's why it sounds natural. We're not playing characters in sales. We're not trying to be somebody else. In fact, all the data from Gong and every other possible like research, you know, and I'm sure Abstract has this data too. Um, I suppose I brought up one of your competitors, <laughs> but okay. everyone who's doing research on this stuff says that relationships are built better and sales happen faster when people bring their authentic selves to calls. You can't bring your authentic self when you're reading someone else's words. So I think it's a desire to control what can't be controlled. And I think it's a lot of just misconceptions about how communication happens. Communication can't happen scripted. It can happen structured, but it cannot happen scripted. So one of the things I work a lot with people on, and I have people who come to me like, hey, help us build a script. I'm like, great, we're going to build a script, but let's quickly define how I use scripts because I will build scripts but they are not say this sentence, then this sentence, then this sentence. It's okay here. Let's talk about one of the things I do with a lot of my clients is I build what I call a value prop nine box. So we pick three personas. We pick three either um, use cases or industries. And based off that, we, with every single, every single new hire goes through the process of learning how to take a base value prop and adjust it for each one of those nine situations. Those nine situations should encompass, should encompass at least half, if not 75 or 80% of your calls. So you've got a targeted value prop to the person on the other end of the line. That's your start. Then we've got a bunch of basically either facts about the product. We've got a bunch of specific responses you can have to objections. We've got a bunch of questions that you can answer. One of those common things new sales reps and especially SDRs struggle with is they don't know what questions to ask let alone what to listen for in the answer. So again, you need that general, how does the business work? Not just what does the product do? Yep. Um, and you give them all of these things in bullet point format. So when I'm building someone a script, it's bullet points. It's here, it's, it's pick a value prop. If they have an objection, here's all your objections and your responses and you just drop things in. So it's like a menu on the table in front of them and you just pick and pull as needed. Yeah. up on a call you still need to you have very specific maybe legal approved things that you can say about this customer but you still put it as like bullet points as much as you can yeah. unless there's a very specific thing that needs to be said in which case explain to your team why they need to say it that way even if the answer is just legal says to do it this way that's fine but give them a yeah. reason yeah. so they understand the context behind it but by giving people bullet points they can string it together in to make whatever it needs to be. So for example, you talked about the box of Legos. I want my SDRs to be able to build within reason and the guardrails, but whatever sort of house that client needs to move to the next step. Do they want yeah. a one bedroom, a two bedroom, tons of windows, no windows, super modern, classic cottage? What do they want? And then yeah. be able to build that. The more narrow are those guardrails, the more narrow the customer that's gonna fit through them. And if you're an early stage startup, you want all the conversations. You want every single conversation it is more valuable to get that intel, even from deals that you don't win, than it is to have someone fall out and you just don't know anything other than they said no. So first things first, I'm a little disappointed you didn't talk about Legos, maybe building like Star Trek Enterprise or Voyager or Millennium oh, Falcon. I the, I, my, my, husband, uh -huh. my husband does these all the time. We have the Ghostbusters um, Ecto literally yeah. in our room. 
Okay. We have the Ghostbusters Ecto. I have. I, I refuse to do the Millennium Falcon just because I don't have any space in my tiny European apartment to do it properly. Okay. Like where to put it? But yeah, no, yeah, all the. Yeah, those are. That's my husband's Christmas and birthday present every year. It's some new giant Lego thing. Okay. Well, if we're going to talk about building box of Legos, let's at least kind of follow the theme of let's nerd out a little bit. At least yeah. let's talk about like you know science fiction spaceships. If we can just kind of agree on that moving forward. Cool. Second thing. Um, I love that you kind of talk about just bullet points and they're, they're more just reminders, right? It's because you don't want them to sound like a robot. Um, if we wanted robots, we would hire robots and we could probably find robots to do our jobs. But ultimately- yeah, That goes really well every time you call your bank trying to get an update on your account and you get the freaking robot teller. That's really doing well. And so Everyone why would you want those. that as a sales motion? Like you don't want that. And so no. you have to, there's a, there's a, there's a delicate balance that companies need to need to find and i think ultimately you mentioned like vcs and so i've been a part of a company where top down from the vc firm it was here's your sales script yeah and i got it and i was like you know i was three months into my job and i was like how the hell do these people know how to sell our software like right? what and the entire team basically crumpled it up, threw it in the trash and was like, okay, we're going to go back to doing what we know how to do. And so there's just such a disconnect between kind of this top down of we know how to sell, we're going to kind of control something <clears throat> that isn't controllable, shouldn't really be controlled. It should be kind of monitored, guided, guided. guided. Yeah. So I guess if I'm a sales rep, kind of Ashley at a company and I'm, I'm feeling like I'm having this script forced down my throat. Like what, what should I be? Probably I should be a looking for a new job, but B how might I try to convince my leadership that there's a, maybe a better way of going about achieving the results we want to get. Ugh. Okay. So if they're honestly, anytime you go to a company and they say, we have a great script, just follow the script. The, the hairs on the back of my neck start standing up and it, it's a big red warning flag for me. There are situations where that's the case. Great. They're very much the exception. So that's one, if you're going into a company, if you're in a company and you're doing the best that you can and they come at you and say, nope, we want you to use this script going forward and nothing else. That's a situation where I'm a huge fan of the best and having been in leadership for a while, uh, this is kind of my pro tip to any IC. If your boss is asking you to do something, you are pretty convinced is going to hurt you. It's not going to let you hit your numbers as well. Commit to their system so much that it's painfully obvious that A, you really tried and two, that the numbers don't lie. So if you've been not using a script and they give you a script, use that script as best as you can according to what they tell you to do, and then look at the numbers and go, hi, I was averaging two meetings a day before. Now I'm using your script. I'm managing half a meeting a day. Can I please go back to making you money? Um, that's option one. Always data doesn't lie. So really looking at, okay, before and after. Um, if you're coming into a company and want you to use a script, try to negotiate a test. Hey, I will commit to this. I will use this for one week. Can I then have a week to adjust it? I'll follow the tone but I'll use it as talking points instead of literal. And I'll do my own thing with it for another week, maybe two, probably longer if you can get two weeks, but start with one. And then can we compare results and see which way is the best way going forward? Most managers will be okay with a limited scope experiment like that, especially if you can show it's going to be data-driven where it's like, hey, let's see which week I can get more meetings with. Yeah. Great. Most managers are going to be okay with that <clears throat> to a point as long as you put parameters on it and you offer to do their way first and commit to it. Um, what a lot of managers will not approve of is if you go to them and say, I don't want to do this. It's not going to work. I want to do it my way. Yeah, it's not going to work. Exactly. It like it kind of, again, it's commit to the system, commit to this, commit to the system so hard it breaks. Yeah. And then change can start happening. That's really the best way to do it um, in terms of getting things through leadership, because especially if it's coming top down, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to change their mind. It's okay to, to speak your mind and say, Hey, I really, I'm, I'm not comfortable with this. Everything in, I, I can't even explain why just everything in my gut says, this is a bad idea. Yeah. I'm going to commit. I'm going to give it everything I can and hold me accountable to that. But if I commit for a week, can I get your commitment back? 
that if I can find a better way to use it that gets us more meetings, I can try. If it doesn't work, I will happily use the script because then I know that the data is good or the script is good. But if I can find a better way, why would you not want my better way? Because yeah, it makes us both more money. Help me help you. Exactly. But you have to, again, it's even with that, it's get defined periods and tie it to numbers, not to opinions. And Love kind it. of go from there. Love it. All right. Well, wrapping up our, our conversation today, Ashley, when you think about the past couple of years at the Duckbell Group and, and maybe what maybe you've learned um, on the other side of sales, what would be, I don't even think if you can, I don't think it would be possible to nail this kind of like one piece of advice, but what would be some advice you would give to maybe a young, young company that is just starting to figure out how to go to market with maybe a couple SDRs, maybe a sales rep on how to go about kind of building that foundation of that roadmap. What actions could they be taking? What could they be thinking about doing? Um, and uh, yeah, let's kind of end with, with that kind of piece of advice from you, Ashley. Document, 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 and get everyone involved in the documenting so that it's constantly updated. Okay. Um, the number one mistake I see small companies especially making is each rep has their own version of their script. And they can be radically different or they can be very similar. The moment you force them to put it all together, get everyone involved in, hey, we'll take the best part of John's, we'll take a little bit of, um, of Bella's, we're gonna take a little bit of Jose and take a little bit from, um, from Sharma, go from there. Boom, 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 sprinkle it all in, build that bullet point structure, and then everyone goes away and tests it. And then everyone comes back in a couple of weeks later and says, this worked, this didn't work. Okay, we'll add another option here because this worked for half the team, but half the team it didn't. But be, get everyone involved in that documenting and that testing. So you're constantly tweaking and adjusting. Um, messaging and scripts are not something that can stay stable. Before the pandemic, scripts were something that were reviewed maybe once a year before the QBRs. Pandemic showed us that at a minimum every six months, they need to be reviewed, if not every quarter. And the best companies, the ones that are able to actually grow effectively, were doing this stuff constantly. Hey, I just found a fun, I just got a great one-liner for this. Hey, I just attended a workshop with John Seelig on comedy and I got this great open. I'm dropping it into the to the to the script so everyone's constantly adding and tweaking hey has anyone else noticed that this objection isn't getting play anymore um hey we just got a new objection how would you guys handle this in the future and by getting everyone involved in creating it and editing it it will stay up to date it'll keep being used because that's the one thing i found with playbooks with scripts is if you come in and just say here's the thing use it you're gonna have a hard time getting them to use it. But if you get the team involved in creating it and feeling some ownership as a result, that's where you get the compliance, but it will taper off if you don't structure consistently going back and soliciting that feedback and getting everyone involved in updating. If you do so that, love, it will keep getting better. I love you talked about like ownership. And that, that's what I was thinking as you were just describing that is if you're getting everybody involved, everybody's gonna have ownership. And so no one's gonna say, well, I didn't contribute to this. I'm not gonna do it this way. It doesn't um, sound like me. I can't use yeah. it. Yeah, Great, because everybody's everybody's contributing to it. And so I'm going to usually I don't do this, but I'm going to have a second part to this question. Um, and so let's say your first couple of sales reps and your founder is a technical person. Um, they don't mm -hmm. have sales experience. I've known people that worked at companies like that where <clears throat> founder, engineer, doesn't know how to sell to save his life. Amazing product. But all they want you talking about is features and the benefits of the product. And how do you, how do you, I, I guess going back, you've already answered this, right? Like work their process, commit to it, and then show them, hey, this isn't working, right? Yes, to a point. Um, okay. Real talk. I, 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 those, that's, you just described my ideal ICP for my consulting work. I love working with engineer founders. I love working with product founders because one, um, there's very little skill overlap, which is nice because that means if they bring me in, they tend to trust me a little bit more yeah. implicitly than sometimes sales led leaders do. But more than anything else though, the problem is 
there's a real bifurcation among those leaders. There's leaders, there's what I call technical leaders who believe they can take engineering and technical methodologies and apply them to the sales process. And there are ones who accept that you can't. If you're dealing with the former, um, I've learned through my career, it, it's a very hard situation for a salesperson to be in as you're building a company. Early in my career, I encountered several of these. And in nearly every case, I ended up leaving the company within, actually, no, in every case, I ended up leaving the company in less than six months because it was just impossible for me to move past it. Yeah. At this point in my career, um, I'm senior enough that I can throw my weight around a little bit and I've gotten better at that. So I'm challenging those conceptions and I'm going, here's, let's talk about the ways that humans screw up this lovely engineering process that you built. I get why you built this. This is a perfectly built process. Here are the five ways that this is going to get screwed up. And having those real hard conversations. If you are the junior person in that relationship, it is nearly impossible to convince them otherwise. You just have to make a decision around, is that the right place for you? Which sucks that you have to kind of say it like that, but sometimes some battles can't be won. Yeah. If you are later in your career or you feel like you're ready for that next step, it is just that, it's walk them through. You hired me for my experience. You hired me for my credibility and my knowledge. I am telling you, this makes sense. I get why you built it this way. Here are the places where it will break because humans, humans aren't machines. This isn't a, this isn't a, you know, kind of a perfectly engineers closed loop, a perfectly engineered closed loop system. It will not work. We can try it, but it will break. And instead we need to engineer a process that has tolerances for that humanity. And that's really where sales reps make their money. It's not on following the process exactly. Sales leaders make their money by building processes that have tolerances for humanity, both the reps humanity and the prospect. I love that. Build tolerances that account for humanity. I love that. Have you used that before? No, but that's good. I'm going to have to write a post about that one. And yeah. tag, tag you. <laughs> I love that. All right. Well, Ashley, wrapping up, uh, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Um, you know, learn more about the Duckville Group, what you can do for sales teams. Um, and obviously, you know, how do I find the, the Other Side of Sales podcast to listen to those episodes? Yeah, so Other Side of Sales is just othersideofsales.com. We've got all of our episodes on there. We're going to be relaunching the blog shortly. And please make sure when you visit to sign up for our, uh, just to give us your email, we're all going to be releasing the sales census, hopefully in early May. So you're going to want to see the results of that and how see how we're, we, as an, we as a B2B industry are doing in terms of major DEI indicators. Um, you can also find me on Twitter, uh, Ashley at work, literally A-T work. That's a very deep cut Star Trek reference. Um, or you can find me on LinkedIn, LinkedIn, you know, slash in Ashley early, just spell my name, right. You can see the episode title. Um, and then, uh, if you are at a company, if you have to listen to this and you're, and you know, your company is built on AWS, the Duckbill group is actually here to help make your AWS bill less horrifying through structural changes, building with cost optimization in mind, as well as potentially coming in and helping negotiate to get you the best terms possible with Amazon. So if you're interested in that, just go to duckbillgroup.com. And that's the, yeah, that's the best way to get a hold of me is those various ventures. But, yeah. Sweet. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you uh, joining us. This was, uh, as expected, we went off on some tangents. We covered a wide variety of topics, everything from um, acting to introverts to scripting. And um, so it's fun. Thank you. I appreciate your time, Ashley. Oh, thanks for tolerating my human meandering box. It's been I fun. would say we this was a pros, a, a, a podcast that accounted for variances in humanity. Yay. <laughs> All right. Take it easy, Ashley. Bye. <laughs>